Psalm 46, one says, God is our refuge and our strength, an ever-present help in the time of trouble. And so in this place this morning, we declare that God is faithful, that whatever you've come in with, whatever burden, whatever worry, whatever anxiety, that there is a God who is constant, that can be trusted, and if you're willing to give him your life, will set you free. Welcome uh, to this incredible experience. And speaking of faithfulness, today we have the incredible opportunity to celebrate a faithful member of our church staff. He has served faithfully for 42 years here at Central Community Church, um, and he has survived five lead pastors. Uh, he, he's been lo here longer than some of you have even been alive. And so today we thought it was worthy of honor, especially as he is officially retiring today. And so we today want to celebrate the great man, the great friend, our pastor, David Topping. Hello, David. Darren from Vancouver. Congratulations on your retirement. You know, I so wanted to be there. I asked if I could come and Bill refused to fly me back. So go figure. Anyway, seriously, when I think of David Topping, I think of three words. Number one, I think of the word godliness. You are one of the most godly men that I've ever met. You're the same man in private as you are in public. And you're a man who honors God and lives for God with your entire being. I also think of the word loyalty. I knew that I could trust you no matter the circumstances. I knew you were a man who was loyal to the congregation, to God, and to myself and my leadership. And the third word that I think of is positive. You're always a guy who had a positive outcome, who always had a positive look on life. Even when things were difficult, you saw the bright side of things, and you were always encouraging. So I thank you for that. Thanking, thank you for being a man who was godly, a man who was loyal, and a man who saw the positive side of things. Congratulations, David. God bless you. I wish I could be there. I love you. Take care. And so today, to celebrate, we have a very special guest. Uh, this is my pastor, my boss, uh, Pastor Lori Gibbons. If you're not familiar with our church structure uh, as an organization, we are a fellowship of churches. So we partner with many other churches across the nation of Canada to do things better together than we could all by ourselves. And so we have a district. We're part of the Western Ontario District. And Pastor Lori Gibbons is the superintendent of our district. And so we thought it would be appropriate for him to come and say a few things uh, to David on this special day. Well, it's an honor and a privilege to be here today and to be able to celebrate this day with you and Lorraine. Amazing 42 years of ministry and in the same church and in the same community and the community that really was your home. So that's an incredible thing. And that you survived five pastors or more. And uh, that, that... It wasn't easy. Well, I'm sure it wasn't. 
I'm sure especially, it was, especially, especially with this one. <laughs> that's, why, that's why I'm turning gray. Yeah, well, that's it. That's it. Can, well, that's why they sent the district. So that's... Uh, <laughs> You're the buffer between that's us. That's right. That's it. So it, it's, it's uh, amazing, too, because I was in Bible college with you, yeah. which was many, many years ago. 42 <laughs> years. I mean... Yeah. You know, that's back in the days of uh, eight-track tapes and uh, no computers, <laughs> right. and uh, so it's amazing what 42 years has meant. Sure. But um, you are such a caring, compassionate individual, consistent and faithful in every way, and uh, we represent today all of the churches in our district, which is 320 churches and 1,000 pastors, and truthfully, all of them that know you and love you would just say uh, resounding congratulations from all of our church family within our district, yes. and we appreciate you. And we want to give you this today on behalf of our district as just a little token of appreciation for your ministry. God bless you. Thank you, Laurie. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you, everybody. I just want everyone, you'll be seeing me around. Um, the, and like somebody th thought I was retiring from life, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not. <laughs> But it's been a wonderful privilege to get to know you folks and love you. I really, truly do love you with the love of the Lord. And I was going to sing that song earlier a few weeks ago, I thought, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to say it, and you will probably be thankful for that. <laughs> but it is a privilege to serve this congregation and to work under the leadership of Pastor Bill. And thank you, Lori. Yes, and so I know that everyone in this room in some way has been impacted. If not you, someone in your family. I think everybody in the Niagara region is one degree of separation from Pastor David Topping. And so I just know that we're going to honor him really well. We love you. Thank you for being such a great friend. Honestly, you have been an anchor uh, through some of the changes and shifts, and you have been faithful and loyal, and I honor you for that. And I just bless you. I pray that this next season is even better than you expect. Enjoy the, that grand baby uh, and enjoy life. And so I think it would be appropriate for all of us in this place to honor Pastor David Topping as he retires today. Let's honor him. It's awesome. I love you. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, welcome. Uh, if you came today, you came on a great day, and what an amazing man. And if you would like to say something to David, they will be in the lobby after the experience today. But also tonight, um, I'm going to explain a little bit more about that in a moment. If, you, if this is your first time with us, thank you so much for being here. If you are watching online, just click the New Here button, and we want to interact with you that way. And if you are here, we'd love to get to know you, answer any questions that you have. And the best way that we can serve you is if you just take a few moments to fill out the connection card that's just there in the seat in front of you. You can take that card and exchange it for our gift. We just want to say thank you for being here. Our gift to you by going to the great big blue wall just outside here in the lobby. And we'd love to exchange that card for a gift and help you navigate any questions or things that you have today. So we're so glad that you are here. And at this time, we are going to give together. And so thank you so much for your faithfulness in giving. The truth is, this church has been in existence almost 100 years. And the awesome thing about that, and my voice cracked, I was so excited. Um, the, the awesome thing about that is that our 100th year anniversary is going to be in a new space. It's going to be a great celebration. But we've only been able to do all of that because of your faithfulness. So thank you as you give today. I'm going to invite the host to come at this time. And as they do, I just have a couple of quick announcements that I would like to highlight for you. Uh, the very first thing is that I want to thank everyone who was a part of our 21 days of prayer. For the past 21 days, this is day 21, we've been meeting in the cafe at 6 a.m. every morning, except for Saturdays at 9, to pray. And it has been amazing. We had so many people show up that we overflowed the cafe. We had to put overflow seating in the lobby. What a powerful time. And so if you were a part of that, thank you. If you weren't and you say, oh, I missed it, that's okay. We're going to be doing it again uh, the week before Easter. And so we'll have a week of prayer then that you can join us. And tonight is the final of our 21 days with our encounter experience. 
If you've never been part of Encounter, Encounter is a little different, actually quite a bit different than our morning experience, where there's just more time to reflect and interact. We have communion, and uh, it's just a really wonderful time of prayer and worship. And so if you'd like to come and maybe press in a little bit deeper to God, maybe, you know, uh, do a little bit more in that area, we invite you back for 6 o'clock. And then at 7 o'clock, we're going to have a farewell with an open mic. (laughs) That's scary. Um, we're going to have an open mic where you can say whatever you like, nice things. Uh, Pastor David, Topping, and Lorraine in the cafe immediately following that experience. So that is tonight at 6 o'clock and 7 o'clock. Then, I also want to let you know that if you're kind of new to our context and you'd like to know a little bit more about who we are, why we do what we do, some of our vision and philosophy, we'd love to invite you to a class called Next Steps. That's happening next Sunday morning. And so you can either go to the great big blue wall and sign up today or you can just show up. And again, it's our opportunity to express who we are, get to know you, and just show you some of the amazing opportunities that are available by being a part of this great family. Well, that's all we have for announcements for now. Uh, we're going to conclude in this series that we've been calling Reset. So the other day I needed something, and so I went to a big box store. You know what that is, right? It's a large, vacuumous area full of stuff that you want, but not what you really need, right? So I go to this store to find something, and I'm walking around, and of course, because they only make millions and not billions of years, they don't pay a lot of staff, and so there's just a very few people. Actually, I can't see anybody. So I am navigating up and down aisles trying to find what I really need, and I can't find it. So in absolute desperation, now women, you need to know that us men, we would rather hit our kneecap with a hammer than ask for help. But I was desperate, and so I decided I better look for some help, and that was an adventure all of its own. And so I heard some giggling around a corner, so I assumed, okay, maybe there's someone over there. I moved in that direction. And sure enough, there was this great big sign that said, Guest Services. So I thought that would be the appropriate place to go. And at the desk of Guest Services were two young people. One girl giggling and typing on a computer. And one guy who I can only assume was training her over her shoulder, laughing and being all bravado. And and I knew that he had some importance because he had this little label that said, Manager. (laughs) <laughs> he hadn't managed to wash his clothes that day, but, but he was the manager of that store. Someone in their wisdom gave him charge of this entire space. And so I walked up, and being very Canadian, you know, I didn't want to interrupt their foray. And so I just stood there patiently for a while, waiting to get some guest service. And uh, when that didn't take place, I coughed, <clears throat> and they finally noticed that I was there. And, and in that moment, the look was man, you really kind of interrupted something special here. Like you're kind of, you know, invading my private space here. Like you're an inconvenience. 
And he said to me, excuse me, sir, I'm very busy. How do you feel? The same way you feel when you've heard that over and over and over in our culture. That word has become so overused. We use it all the time for all kinds of reasons. I'm busy. We use it as an excuse when we don't want to do something. I'm busy. We use it as an excuse when we don't want to be with somebody. I'm busy. Everybody's busy. The la- I heard an eight-year-old once say, I'm busy. Are you kidding me? You're busy? So I looked at this kid. I'm thinking, you're busy. Air traffic controllers. Now they're busy. Mom's at home. They're busy. Drake on the dance floor. He's busy. You are not busy. <laughs> but I've been working on that all week. We, but, <laughs> oh, there's more. Um, but we use that term. We live in this culture that's been saturated with this concept that we are busy. The truth is that there are many of you in this room who, if you are honest, you are overwhelmed. The truth is you're having a hard time sleeping at night. You're anxious. You are stressed out. You don't know how you're going to meet up with all the demands, and you feel busy. And the only word you can express to to kind of somehow describe your life is, I'm busy. It gets so ridiculous we have busy wars. You know what I'm talking about, right? Where you meet somebody and they express how busy they are. So you feel the need to express how busy you are, right? Oh, yeah, I'm just so busy. I missed lunch. And oh, yeah, well, I was so busy last week. I didn't eat at all. Oh, yeah, well, I was so busy that I had to stay up to 3 o'clock in the morning. And I had to get up 6 because I'm so busy. Oh, yeah, well, I'm so busy. I start work before I go to sleep. I mean, it just gets ridiculous, right? And it's become this catchphrase to actually describe a deeper problem with us. And we know we were not designed for this. We know it because we know something is wrong. It starts to impact us, right? It starts to impact our health. It starts to impact our emotions. It starts to impact our relationship. It impacts everything around us. And we see the destructive nature of stress and anxiety, but we just don't know what to do. And this this feeling is is partly perception. Uh, Here's the reality. You may not like this, but it's true, that we as a culture have more leisure time than any other time in history. It's the truth. I mean, go back to the Dark Ages. Go back to any of your historical roots, and you will see that most people in history, as soon as the sun was up, they were working, and they worked until the sun went down, and they slept to repeat that over and over and over again. We have more leisure time. The the problem is, the, the, the other issue is that we just are poor time managers. We cram all this stuff. We have more time, but we cram it with more stuff. Our holidays aren't relaxing because we're too busy doing stuff. So we can post it on Facebook and brag that we were actually significant. Our holiday was better than yours. Can you see how sick it gets? It's partly uh, fear. We're afraid to be alone. They did this really interesting study at the University of Virginia, and they put their test subjects um, in a room with no technology. Actually nothing, not even a pen. There was nothing to do in this room. It was a sterile room with one chair. And they said you had to stay in absolute silence for 15 minutes. And in the middle of this room, they had one button. And when you push this button, it gave you an electric shock. That hurt. But 67% of men and 23% of women got obsessed with rather, they would rather be hurt physically than be left alone with their thoughts. Shocking, isn't it? (laughs) But I think the deeper problem, (laughs) the deeper dysfunction is that we've actually treated time as a commodity. That somehow our significance, our value, our importance, our worth is tied up in time. 
And so if we're not busy, we must be insignificant. If we're not busy, we must not matter. If people aren't asking us to do this and be there and hang out with who's who, we feel insignificant. And the deep sickness is that we don't even like ourselves. We don't like the thoughts in the stillness. We don't like feeling insignificant. And so we rush from here to there trying to make sure that our kids play in the NHL because somehow that would make me significant. Make sure that our kid is the next Nobel Prize winner because that will make me significant. And so we run around. They hate it. We hate it. We fight. We squawk. We don't eat properly. And yet we carry on because we believe the lie of our culture that busy actually is equated to significance. So what do we have to do about this? Well, in this series, we've been talking for four weeks on this concept of reset. How do you reset your life? When your life is out of control, chaotic, how do you reset it? And we've been leaning on ancient wisdom to solve modern problems. And the book in the Bible that we've been looking at is the book of Psalms. If you're not familiar with the Bible, it's kind of right in the middle of your Bible. It's in a part of the Bible that's called the Old Testament, which simply means the writings before Jesus came to the earth. And in this, we see poetry, really. It's a, it's a book of poetry, of prayers, of songs, that people would sing and be reminded of what really mattered when life was crazy and chaotic. You know, it's like when you're dizzy, they say focus on one point to kind of center yourself. It's this idea that when, we're, when the world, it feels like the earth is being pulled out from underneath your feet. It's a focal point to keep you steady. And so in Psalm chapter 46, verse 1, we're going to read today. So if you have your Bible, I want you to turn there. If you don't have a Bible today, that's all right. It will be on the screen. But I do know you have a mobile device because <laughs> you're very busy. And so, um, so on that mobile device, you can download the Uversion app and you can follow along. The reason I want you to turn there today and the reason I want you to look it up on your mobile device is because I want you to reflect on it every day this week. And I want you to ask you the question, am I in a place of sickness or in a place of stillness? And that will determine your health. So, so the psalmist in Psalm 46, verse 1, says these words, echoing through the chambers of time into this moment. It's as if he anticipated you and I sitting here wrestling with what to do with our busyness. And he responds by saying, God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear that word fear is synonymous with being anxious or concerned or worried or stressed. I will not fear. Though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though the waters roar and the foam and the mountains quake with their surging, when it feels like I'm being pummeled by life, when it feels like the ground I'm standing on is unsteady, when it feels like the relationships I should be able to trust are crumbling into the sea. And the things I put my hope in are failing me. Verse 10. God's response in that situation is, be still. It's hard, isn't it? Be still. And know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. And so the answer, the, the, the solution to this symptom, this problem of our society, is to be still. What does that mean? I mean, really, what does that mean? I love, I love that we can break these words down into each of their own meanings, but this word be, what does it mean to be? You see, again, we live in a world that, that says you're not good enough, and so you have to put on a mask. You have to put on a persona. Uh, we call it a profile. You, you pretend that everything is great, and so you make sure you get the picture just at the right angle, right? Right? That's why you take 20 and delete 19 and keep the one, and then you put a filter on it. Um, and, it and it's why when we meet somebody and we say, how are you doing? We always say, oh, I'm great. 
right? When two men meet, the first thing is, so what do you do for a living? It's our way of evaluating where we stand on the social stratus. Or, or with women, it's about appearance and connection and relationship. It's, it's this battle. But the Bible reminds us that we can just be the amazing thing about the God of the Bible, and Jesus reinforces it, is that God loves you just the way you are. Every mark, every scar, every failure, every mistake. He's okay. You don't have to pretend. You don't have to jump through religious hoops. You don't have to be something you're not. That there's a space in your existence where you can just be vulnerable and weak and scared and it's okay. Maybe you had a great parent and so you remember those moments when you were a child and there was something about just being, wasn't there, with your, with your parent? That parent that loved you? There was something about being with that person who you knew you could just be yourself. They saw you without your makeup on. <laughs> they saw you w- without, without the performance that everyone else uh, you know, ascribed to you. They, they knew you and you're good and you're bad. There is nothing more beautiful for me when I have a friend who's seen me at my worst, <laughs> just come to a volleyball game sometime, um, see me at my worst and still loves me. And then the amazing thing about, about the Bible is that you've been told a lie about God. You've been told a lie that he's somehow angry and wants to beat you up and has been pursuing you just to get after you. And that's not the truth. That you can be and you can be still. You know, when, I've told this story a lot, but when I was a little kid and I'd get angry, and I got angry a lot, and I didn't know what to, to, to do with my emotion. I didn't know how to process what I was feeling. I would just start flailing. I would just flail at everything. I would lash out with words and fists, and my mom, in those moments, would identify it, and she'd come, and she would just put my arms beside my body, and I hated it at first, but it was this need to just stop. Stop striving Stop trying to impress everybody. Stop worrying about what people think. Stop. Imagine a space where you didn't have to do anything. And it's not just the cessation of activity. It's actually a stillness. It's this focused stillness because in that stillness, there's a reason. Why be still? So that you can know something. That that no, that word in the original language means to get intel, to be informed by past experience or character. It's this idea that in that stillness you can be reminded of the most important thing. That there is a God who made you and who loves you and has something for you. And all the things you're fighting for, he has already for you. You just need to let go. It's this image of in the middle of a battle, being able to just to put down the sword and you have someone in your corner. Remember when you were a kid, you had someone in your corner? Remember that moment? Maybe, maybe you had someone stand up for you in a verbal sparring match and you had someone with you, you had some support, you had some strength that bolstered you. you. You realized you weren't alone. It's this idea, be still and know that I am God. You're not God. I know you're smart and I know you're beautiful And I know you're talented. I have the incredible privilege of of knowing so many of you and you have so much to offer this world. But as strong as you are, as talented as you are, there are things in this world that you cannot handle. And if you think you can, I'm so sorry because you're setting yourself up for disappointment. And it's in those moments when it seems so overwhelming in the impossible that God says there's this space in my presence where you can be still and know that I am God. We've been using this image throughout this series to kind of re- reiterate this, this truth of what it means to reset your life. And, and in week number one, we learned that it starts by just becoming aware, aware of where you are and becoming aware of where you need to be and making the decision to go for it, that God is a God of order. And we talked about how there's this rhythm in God's in a world and you were designed to live in it. And, and the great thing about God's created order is that he gave you choice. You can either embrace it or reject it. The devastation of rejecting it, though, the consequence is that you bring chaos into your life. And so through confession, you can be reestablished into God's order, God's rhythm, God's timing, and it's infinite. 
And then in week number two, we learned that, that happiness is not a destination. It's not like you're on this journey toward happiness, that actually happiness is just a direction. It's just working with God in the flow of your life. And then in week number three, we learned that you need to learn the balance between rest and action. That when you do it God's way, when you put God at the center, which is today, you find purpose in your activity. But when you start to take charge, you find yourself in a place of stress. And if you don't address it, it will lead to destruction. But if you acknowledge it in this space, God can prune you and bring you back into this place of rejuvenation, of true rest. And last week we learned if you stay in this too long, you become disengaged, and that too leads to destruction. And so you come back to God, and he gives you back purpose. It's just an infinite rhythm of you and God working together like a great symphony, like, like um, dancers in sync. It's, it's this beautiful image of what you were designed for. But it only works if you put God at the center and when it's chaotic, to be still and know that I am God. To know that I am God. One of my favorite stories in the Bible is about a guy named Peter. And I think I like Peter because I identify with him. Uh, Peter is a bit headstrong. Actually, he's a lot headstrong. Uh, and Peter, in his emotion, gets his words in front of him. He puts his foot in his mouth all the time. Like, if you read the story, poor Peter. Like, he's always opening his mouth, and you're like, oh, just, just keep your mouth shut, Peter. Like, you'll, be, you'll do so much better. I mean, I love your passion. I love your zeal. And I just identify with him. Peter feels like a failure a lot. And, but he just loves Jesus, and he just really wants to do what is right. And so he's one of the 12 followers of Jesus. We call them disciples. And so in this one story, Jesus says to them, okay, uh, they've just done some teaching. And he says, I want you to get in a boat and go across the this, this sea. There's the Sea of Galilee. It's a really short distance. And you got to remember that most of these first followers of Jesus were fishermen. So this isn't really a hard task. Jesus says, I want you to trust me. No problem. We'll do it. And uh, how are you going to get there? Don't worry about it. I'll meet you on the other side. They don't think about that. They go, okay, great, we'll see you there. And so they, get, they head off on this, this uh, tour, this three-hour tour. And um, anyway, so they're all in this boat, and, and in, in the middle of the ocean, the sea, which is really kind of like a gigantic lake, this huge storm suddenly uh, attacks them. And they found themselves in a very desperate situation. The, the word in, in the Bible translated to English is the waves were buffeting them. Um, we don't really use the word buffet. You know, I got buffeted in that boxing match. Uh, but it means violent opposition. In violent opposition. And it's this image of you and I in our life when we think everything is going great. We're just minding our own business. Maybe we're even doing what God has asked us to do. And suddenly a storm comes. We feel buffeted by the circumstances of life. Overwhelmed. It says to the point where they feared for their very lives. It's those nights that you cried yourself to sleep. It's those nights you couldn't sleep because you were so anxious. Your mind whirling with all the possibilities and how you were going to get out of this. It's a storm of that word that cut so deep that you don't know if you're ever going to recover from it. It's the storm of life when the rug is pulled out from you and your finances and you are trying to figure out a way to provide and you don't know how it's going to happen. It's, it's the storms of life. It's that doctor's report. Things are going great. Now, they're not great at all. What do you do in those moments? So they do what we do. They, they paddle harder. They bail more. They add more work. Just be busier. Try harder. And it's not working. And then suddenly, into this scene, appears a figure. <laughs> and you can imagine, um, if you're in the middle of a storm, and then suddenly there is a being, a person, standing on the water, your reaction would be theirs. It's a ghost! That's the actual translation. Um, and it's a ghost, because when you're in that, you ask, you can't even see God when he's there. They don't even see him, and, and, and Jesus goes, hey guys, hey, hey, relax. Be still, and know it's me. I'm here for you. And then Peter, he's my favorite. Ah, knucklehead. Um, he says, okay, well, um, if it's you, then ask me to come out onto the water. 
Now, if you're one of the other 11 guys, you're thinking, oh, you did not think this one through. Uh, first of all, fishermen in that day, they didn't really swim. They, they, they were actually afraid of water, which is ironic if you're a fisherman. But anyway, they, they were that. And I'm pretty sure that in Hebrew school, they covered, maybe they didn't call it the law of physics, but the fact that people can't walk on water, that's impossible. And so Peter makes this audacious claim. He is so desperate. It's like so many people in the Bible. He just cries out for help. And maybe you're here, and we can't hear it, but God hears it. You're crying out for help. And so Jesus says, okay, Peter, come on out. <laughs> now what do you do, right? I can just see the other disciples going, oh, yeah, this is bad. It's going from bad to worse. I mean, have you ever tried to get in a boat off a dock? Imagine trying to get out of a boat in the middle of a storm in the water. Things are moving, shaking, it's violent, it's crazy, it makes no sense. Do you think one of the other disciples went, hey, Peter, no, 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 buddy, just sit down. Love the thought, love the passion, love the intent, just sit right down. This is crazy, but he doesn't. He gets out, he puts a foot down, he's looking at Jesus and going, "Woo! all right, you know. Of course, he's holding the boat, because that could be awkward, and he steps over and he, and he starts walking. He's walking on water, people. Now, that may not amaze you. And you may be here and you're one of those people who debates whether it really happened or not. Just enjoy the story. Seriously. Your cynical is stressing you and everyone else out. <laughs> he walks on water, but then he sees the storm again, right? And he shifts his eyes off of what he knows, what he sees, that Jesus is there and he goes back to what he knew before. And all he sees is the storm, and he thinks, this is crazy, this is impossible, and he begins to sink. But I love, I love the story, because the word right after there, it says immediately. Not a moment passes, not a second passes, but because he is obedient, that Jesus reaches down his hand and catches him. And he says these words, which to us we read with cynical minds as criticism. I don't think it was. He says, why? Where's your faith? Why, why didn't you just know who I was? I'm not going to let you fall. Do you know who I am? I am the God who with a single word made everything you experience. The fact that you're breathing this perfect mixture of oxygen and whatever else is in it, because I'm not a scientist, the fact that you're doing that is a miracle. I did that with a word. I, I, I'm the God who created you. I am the God who delivered men from lion's dens and killed giants with a single stone. I am the God who kept people safe in fiery furnaces. I am the God who left heaven for you. This is who I am. Peter, never doubt that. Never question that. And it says they got back in the boat, and Jesus says, oh, by the way, storm stop. And it did. And the other disciples, the other 11 disciples who actually I think are the cowards in the story, the other 11 who heard Jesus say the same thing but were rather, would rather stay in the safety of their boat, what they know, than trust a God who is greater than the physical reality that we see, their declaration is, wow, you really are the Son of God. You see, there's this space when we tap into it of stillness, focused stillness, that we find God's strength. Be still and know that I am God. And so today I'm going to make a couple declarations over you. And you have a choice. You can believe them or not. And I'll tell you, the consequence of not believing them is to still struggle in your own strength to try to solve it and find destruction or to disengage from life, to lean into that addiction, to lean into that chaos and find destruction. Or today you can be reinstilled into purpose and be rejuvenated by a God who's with you. So let me declare this over you today. There is a God who is a healing God. There is a God who is a providing God. There is a God who is secure and strong. The Bible says he is a fortress. And when the enemy comes, if you're in that fortress, you are safe. Yes, you have to stay inside the walls of that fortress, but you are safe. There is a God who is a loving God. There's a God who is with you in this storm. You're not alone. 
And so the Bible reminds us to be still and know that I am God. What do you need God to do in your life today? What area of your life do you need to be still in? Do you need to stop striving? you need to give up? Stop avoiding? Stop numbing? Stop trying to fix it. What area of your life do you just need to admit today? I can't do this, God. I need you. What area of your life do you need God to show up and calm the storm? And so, God, I thank you for this reminder today. I need to hear it over and over and over again because left to my own device, I am tempted to try to fix it. I am tempted to believe that I can solve it. I just got to work harder. I got I to do more. And God, my way every time leads to destruction. Oh, I may, I may be able to scrape my way through, but the cost is high. Because in my attempt, I've wounded myself, I've hurt others. In my attempt, I've lost the things that really matter. So God, I need to find this space again where I can just be still. And God, if it's true, and it is, that you love me just the way I am, I come. I'm so broken. I'm not who I should be. I know it. I'm so frustrated with myself. But you aren't. I don't get it. But you aren't. And you love me. And you step into my storm and you say, Bill, it's me. I'm here. I can do it. I am the God of the impossible. So just trust me. Just trust me. So this morning, we're going to end our experience with worship as we've been doing for this series. And it's our opportunity to respond to what we have heard. And so for some of you, you're going to just have to believe again that there's a God who's great. For some of you, maybe this is your first time here. Maybe this is the first time you're watching online and you've ever heard a message like this, but you know, you know that you need God today. Today's your day. It's not an accident that you're here. It's not by chance that you said yes to the invitation. You're here because God wants to meet you. And so how do you do that? You just say, God, I'm, I'm here. I want to do it your way. There are a lot of you in this room, though. You've been a part of church and for a long time and you know this but you haven't been living it if you're honest you've been striving fighting fixing and today God just wants to step in and say be still and know that I'm God stillness isn't always quiet sometimes it's proclamation that's what we're going to do and so I want you to use your words to proclaim to declare God I need you so whatever you need today whatever storm you find yourself in sing these songs of declaration and thanks and praise, believing that God is with you in your storm. I invite you to stand as we sing the next few songs and declare as Pastor Bill was just sharing.
reminds us that God is an ever-present help in trouble. It doesn't mean that always He's going to deliver us in the moment from the storm, but He's with us in it. And then the result is, therefore, we will not fear. So I was thinking about this, and something hit me as we were singing in the first experience, and I feel like we should do it here as well. But in our culture, we physically demonstrate things that we're feeling inside all the time. So if you go to a birthday party and you love that person, you give them a gift. You, we know that the gift is just a token of something far deeper, our love and appreciation for them. And so we physically enact something that's happening inside of us. Or if you sign a contract, you sign on the dotted line, um, you're just physically enacting that I'm gonna keep my promise. Or when you get married, you give each other rings. It doesn't make you married. It's just a reminder. It's a physical act of something that's happening inside of you. So today, we are going to physically enact something that maybe you want to happen inside of you. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to take your hand like this right now. And if you're completely uncomfortable doing it, that's okay, you don't have to. But let's try to do this together. And I want you in this moment to fill your hand with all the worries and all the concerns that you're carrying. You see, I want you to think about that financial situation, that physical situation, that relational issue, the things that you've been carrying and they're weighing you down. And then I want you to close your hand on it. And in just a moment, we're gonna give up. You say, well, give up, that's a weak thing. No, it's not. If I'm carrying a heavy pack that I can't carry and someone stronger than me comes along and says, hey, would you like me to carry that for you? I'm happy to give that up right? If, if I have a mortgage that's crushing me and someone comes along and says, hey, I'll pay that for you, you'd be more than happy to give up. But what about the things that really matter, the things that are weighing you down, the things that are crushing you? In just a moment, we're going to give them up. I do want to remind you before we do this, though, that I want to invite you back tonight at 6 o'clock for our encounter experience. And I also want you to know that if you're here, if you're watching online, and you'd like some answers, uh, some questions answered, just interact with our online pastor. If you're here in this experience live, just know there's going to be a prayer team here at the end. They'd love to pray with you. Or you can take that connection card, fill it out, and either drop it off in one of the four boxes on your way out, or take it to Central Connect, and someone will meet you there and talk it through with you. Also want to remind you that next Sunday, we're starting a new series called Guardrails. We don't like guardrails until, or we don't need them until we need them, right? And so we're going to talk about that next week. But as we close today, I just felt, before I bless you, that we need to make a physical proclamation. And in just a moment, if you are here, and you're ready, you're willing to let God step into the situation and take it, in a moment, we're going to open our hand and lift it up into the sky. And in that moment, some of you are going to feel something. You're actually going to feel something because you're going to believe that this is what's happening in my heart. God, I'm giving it to you. God, I'm giving you my worries, my cares, my concerns. It's okay to feel that. It might, it might, some of you might even want to express it in some way. But today, we're going to give this up saying, God, today I choose to be still and know that you're God. You're God of this. It's not mine to carry. 
I'm giving it to you. So are you ready? Are you ready for breakthrough? Are you ready for a miracle? Are you ready for victory? Because in this moment, God is going to take your sorrow and turn it into joy. God is going to take your pain and turn it into peace. God is going to take the things that are crippling you and he's going to use them as an opportunity for his glory to be revealed. So if you are ready for God to do something with the storms of your life, on three, I want you to raise your hand and open up and give it up. Are you ready? One, two, three. We give it up. God, we give it up to you. We give it up to you. We give it up to you. And so today I bless you with the truth that God is with you in the storm, that he has never present help in trouble. I bless you with the truth that you are not alone. You've never been. I bless you with the truth that God is willing to step into your situation. And if you will trust him, he will show you the way out. I bless you with the truth that even though you are not strong enough to do it on your own, God is. And I bless you with the truth that all he has for you is victory and hope and deliverance. And so may you reset your life, reset your life directed toward him, letting go of everything that you hold on to and saying, God, I trust you completely with my life, with my family, with my relationships, with my finances, with my health, with my emotions, with my mind. I trust you with everything. And so today I bless you with the victory that comes in the name of Jesus. For peace is not an emotion, it's not a feeling, it's a person. And his name is Jesus. So may you live in peace as you reset your life every moment of this week. And as you live in victory, may others see it in you and proclaim truly, he is the Son of God. I bless you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Go in peace.